I think we, to some degree, represent sort of mainstream positions. I mean, this is, to me, transhumanism is the cutting edge of the entire techno project, if you will. Mm. And conversely, I think what we're doing is raising questions about the very basis for all this, starting with domestication and civilization and and running its course into the high technology phase of civilization. Yes, and so we're yes. trying to raise questions about the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I so agree. I think it's, uh, you know, it's almost, we could say overdue, but in other words, it's just it's sort of uh, in the cards, I would say, that this conversation in general, I don't mean just ours, but, you know, it's, it's, it's going to have to take place. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, there are many in the transhumanist community who, who feel as though the conversation really needs to be brought into the mainstream. It's, I don't agree that it's completely fringe, although there has been a, a recent movie, which you may have seen, Transcendence, which does oh, yeah. um, highlight the, the tension between some of the polar opposites between two ways of looking at the world. Hugo de Garris has sort of written about these ideas as well. The tension between like what he calls the Terrans and the Cosmists, and the Cosmists are considered the people who are just techno-optimists, and the Terrans are considered to be like primitivists. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, I think that the well-considered transhumanists out there um, aren't completely techno optimist in the sense that they think that everything's going to be fine it doesn't matter what we do technology will as it you know has its own sort of pseudo agency will will save us in the end without us really having to do anything about it we'll probably be a bit cautious with with technology and and uh, we'll want to guide technology in towards beneficial ends instead of just lighting a fuse and hoping for the best you know it's uh it's interesting there that uh I think there's quite a parallel. You could just rephrase that in terms of the primitivist uh, camp. In other words, I think, speaking of well-considered people, uh, we're not to be confused with the so-called collapsists who feel that, well, this civilization will fall. Every civilization so far has fallen. So we just sit back and let it fall, and then we'll be able to emerge somehow and everything will be positive. But I mean, I don't, none of the people I work with uh, feel that way, that we have to take the responsibility to to do something to, uh, you know, to provide a, a better scenario than just sitting passively waiting for it to collapse. Yeah. What, what sort of things do you think you can do in order to increase the odds of having a beneficial future, whatever that may be? Well, that's okay. Now we're coming, <laughs> we're coming into the uh, collision, the uh, inevitable collision part. I would say about our respective points of view, and that is, I would say, one of the very key things is to bring out into the public discourse the uh, what I would say is the alarming reality of of galloping technology. We, we're seeing the pace of technological change. Uh, seemingly constantly picking up and uh, and we look at it extremely negatively and, and you can't just well we can I mean and we have just taken it for granted it's just a neutral thing it's not uh, you know it's a it's not political and so forth you always hear that and that's the way to mask what's really going on that in fact it is political it, it involves choices and values and you can just ignore that that in itself is a choice. And I think what we're really talking about is, for one thing, the, the, empirical, uh, the empirical facts. Okay, we've got more and more and more technology, and the, these transhumanists uh, <laughs> say we've got to have even more, and then we'll have this quantum leap that Kurzweil and, and you know, people talk about. Well, so what's the record? things are getting horrible in, in every way you can slice it, it seems to me. It's not getting better. Things in every sphere seem to be getting worse. So what's why would anyone think that more technology is the answer? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there are certainly disruptive technologies that at least initially destabilized civilization and have caused people to flourish less. Even the the beginnings of the agrarian civilization, they weren't better off than the hunter-gatherers. In fact, they were living in vermin 
the only reason it seems why they survived, why uh, agrarian civilization took off, was because they had so many children to look after the the plants and and till the soil and and make sure all the crops were growing properly and to defend borders and all that sort of thing. Exactly, was, yeah, exactly. So, that's that's kind of our starting point. <clears throat> When Jared Diamond said it's the worst mistake the human race ever made, the move to agriculture, well, mm -hmm. we take the implications of that rather seriously. And uh, the technology <clears throat> is the face of that domesticating move. That is domestication, the, the ethos of control. Mm -hmm. It's just moving it up from farming to, uh, you know, nanotechnology and everything else. I mean, that's, <laughs> to put it in a nutshell, it's a crude way to put it, but that's the very same problem we have now. It's implicit in that move. Mm -hmm. It's just the further uh, logical uh, steps that do ensue once you once you have made the shift to to control. You know, whether it's surveillance or GMOs or whatever, it's just more and more and more control, and it doesn't lead to a healthy uh, life world. It just doesn't. I mean, it's it's just. Uh, but, you know, that's why we're, I mean, that's why, in, you know, we really are at sort of polar opposites, I'm afraid. I, I don't want to, you know, pick a fight here unnecessarily, but mm. there you go. There's two choices, technology, yes or no. Yeah, I think just picking fights for the sake of it doesn't necessarily um, bring out the real, the best points from each side of the debate. You know, uh, it becomes more like an intellectual blood sport when I see that sort of thing happening. It's interesting if you see some of these like high profile debates on YouTube or TV, each side wants to see the other side reach some sort of existential crisis and fall down in a sort of heap of quivering mass and suddenly admit that they were wrong all along, right? It's not going to happen. It never does. <laughs> it's interesting well, yeah, to watch. <laughs> maybe it never does, but you know, that in itself doesn't prove, I mean, it doesn't mean that, uh, I mean, I'm not going to change my point of view, I don't think, that what is technology bringing, it's it's awful. And so I would like to see it go away, period. I mean, it's just not, none of it holds up, in my view, if you analyze it. I mean, what are the claims of technology in general? You know, how it's, we're more empowered, we're more connected, we have more diversity. Hmm. None of those things are true. They're completely false, if you start looking at it. So... It's, it's about very basic things, and I think, I mean, I, I have to disagree, Adam. It's not, it's not about looking for common ground if you feel, if you have come to the conclusion that this is really a disastrous course and it needs to stop. And, you, you, of course, you don't agree with that, but that's, you know, and that's, it's not a matter of being personally nasty or anything like that, but it's no. just a matter of what conclusions do you come to. I don't have a problem with voluntary anacro primitivism in the sense that it seems like an attractive option for some. I'd like to see a future where different ideologies can thrive without compulsion, if you know what I mean. I'd, I'd, I'd rather see a, t a future where different lifestyles are enabled. It may be too Pollyannistic of me to think that, but that idealistically, that's what I'd like to see. It's well, but, but we have to, let's examine that. I mean, I would, I would say in response, it's a totalizing system. You don't get to opt out. You know, it's just, it really is, there isn't a free choice about it. There, there is no room already for any kind of hunter-gatherer life or, or something like that. There just simply isn't. It's been exterminated by by the machine it simply has by domestication so yeah i have to say it's it's really it is pollyannish to say i mean that would be nice we could all have our our particular life world and you do it your way we'll do it our way but that you know it's really that's not looking at at prehistory or hi history there's no grounds for that i'm afraid some transhumanists would say it differently some transhumanists look at the world and see that there's so many different forms of culture out there now. The population is, is large and, and it seems there is quite a diversity in the different lifestyles that one can have. 
although it seems that there is a convergence towards the use of high technology like the internet and mobile phones, mobile computing, uh, search engines, and social networks in order to yeah. improve and augment life, but it also has the side effect that you know is a little bit undesirable. Well, yeah, so that's the thing. I, they, what about the diversity? You, you bring it up. I mean, yeah, there are cultural differences that are still there. They're being eroded away pretty fast. Every yeah. airport on the planet is identical and, you know, everybody in the biggest cities dresses the same now and watches the same TV. I mean, you know, it's not, there isn't really, and even if there, and there still are, I grant you, there are cultural differences. I've traveled pretty widely. I've been in India three times, for instance, and et cetera, but there's only one civilization now. It's a global, unitary, total civilization and everybody marches to its step. I don't care if you're in Africa or wherever, it's it's just, that's, that's the reality. Mm. The reality is that there is infrastructure that has been so powerful that all cultures, at least most of them anyway, have opted in, have decided to use mobile phones, have decided to have a network, have decided to use computers, have decided to use medicine and all these sorts of things. There are some things that a lot of primitivists would not practically like to give up. The access to some medicine would be very useful if your child was suffering from an illness that couldn't be treated without penicillin, for instance. Yeah, yeah, granted. Oh, sure, that's, that's quite so. I mean, or you could put it the other way around and say, we're being held hostage by all these different things, all these conditions that mainly have been created <laughs> in a general sense by, by the... Uh, productionist, uh, you know, techno world. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that, uh, uh, for example, starting with epidemics, you know, now we've got all of these, and, you know, the technology hasn't even solved them. I mean, we've got Ebola going on in Africa. we got the MERS thing, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, on and on. There's, uh, I could, I've got a list of stuff just from today's paper that I won't bore you with, but, you know, that's the way you don't get outside of it because we are held hostage you know and every infectious disease is a disease of civilization for instance all these all these different plagues and so forth they didn't they weren't around in hunter-gatherer times because you didn't have big numbers of sedentary populations in which they breed mm -hmm. but you yeah, know your question about freedom of that. i'm not sure if it's always the case because even hunter-gatherer tribes that still exist today in the Amazon still get infections. Yeah, they um, do, but that's because of contact from outside. That's not, there, there doesn't seem to be evidence for that in the, like, you know, if you go back before domestication, that's, there isn't anything, there's really nobody who isn't contacted. And if they are, as you know, I'm sure they, they rapidly die of these commonplace uh, diseases that we have that we've, we've gotten used to. But, you know, your question about freedom, I think that's kind of interesting. People chose to do this and that. You know, I had a friend here in Eugene, and this is way back in the 80s. We, we made a, uh, some posters and flyers. We were, we were thinking about, in a sort of clumsy way, we were thinking about technology. And this was back in the early 80s when the PC explosion started. Way back, right? Mm -hmm. And... We used to get this response from people when we raised these questions about where is it going. People would say, well, if you don't want a PC, don't buy one. Mm -hmm. Okay, stop, stop griping about it. Well, very rapidly that became not a choice, okay? I mean, if I want to contact somebody uh, in terms of speaking or whatever it might be, I can write them a letter, but I think you know as well as I do I could throw that in the wastebasket. You have to have an email account, right? You have to have all these things. It's not a choice. Right. I don't want to do well, it, it that is. way. It's a, there's, it's a, no, there's it's stop, not they're an not individual to... choice. It's a, it's a social choice, I think. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say that an individual would be able to make choices about other people's actions, but social choices, societal choices yeah. are what we're talking okay. about. Here. Yeah. yeah, I know. We've the, That's... Uh, it, to me, that's because we haven't been able to really discuss this very much, uh, or at least maybe that's part of it. Mm. Where yeah. are we going as a society? That Have you ever heard a politician talk about that? 
it's it's off limits. You you just don't. It's not uh, it's not respectable or it's not part of the of the conversation when you use the word political. And yet it's fundamentally political. And that if of course if that doesn't change, then yeah, we'll just be chained to more and more and more technology and just uh, you're in it for the ride and you know all the different choices go away for example in this country i don't know about australia but they are discontinuing teaching handwriting for children Hmm. because they're going to be on the keyboard the rest of their lives they're not going to write anything by hand Hmm. that's that's not a good thing in my view that's just standardization uh Again, you know, anyway. Well, 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 even like writing is a technology, advanced language is a technology. It's going to be very, very difficult to encode like a rule. If we were to go back to primitivism, like hunter-gatherer tribes, if we were to get rid of language, how would we then encode some law, some rule to stop somebody from doing an upstart technology thing and, you know, creating spears or inventing new forms of language and like writing and all those sorts of things? What's to stop us from rising again to civilization? I don't know. I, all I can think of is why would you go down the, the wrong road twice? I mean, if we're going to learn something, as, I mean, as I see it, uh, you, you don't want to repeat the same mistake. You don't want to kill off the natural world hmm. like we're doing faster and faster, right? right. You, you know, we both know we could reel off a hundred things that are just eco-disasters already it's not a coming thing it's already here Hmm. right so wouldn't we learn from that and and you know i think the other how how would we we keep that learning in some form of like stable condition how how would we be able to take that wisdom and pass it back to the hunter and gatherer tribes of tomorrow so that's a good question without language without advanced forms of recording it would be very very hard to have that particular lesson maintained look i'm sure in the past, like there's previous examples before agrarian civilization took hold of hunter and gatherers roaming nomadic lifestyle, causing megafauna to become extinct. In Australia, the Aboriginals often burnt down forests, either accidentally or on purpose, in order to get a meal. Um, and our environment in Australia before Europe came and invaded was shaped by the hunter and gatherer tribes by human existence in Australia and that was only what 40,000 years ago since they were here well okay Um, but yeah I think I think we could probably find examples either way but is it really comparable to what we're doing now hmm. I mean yeah there there are uh, when you consider I mean the megafauna extinction uh, ideas have been kicked around some of that some of that's been debunked and some of it hasn't but you know, we had in um, North America millions upon millions of bison or buffalo, right? And it wasn't until Europeans came and slaughtered every one of them uh, that, that, I mean, people were here for a long time and they didn't do that. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, it, I could throw out different examples, but I mean, I think well, what I... we have from the, from the ethnology, from the anthropology, is that human species lived for about two million years and they didn't do what we're doing now. They didn't create this insane population level. They didn't, uh, they didn't pollute everything. I mean, they had, and you know, I don't know if, I don't know how maybe you're uh, savvy anthropology wise or not, but you know, some of the stuff we're talking about, people have said, well, that's just kind of an anarchist fantasy or utopia, but actually, the orthodox view in anthropology now sounds surprisingly uh, utopian, if you will. I mean, for, this is for, let me just tell you one thing. I could go on for hours, but just one thing. The ethos of, of uh, forager life or hunter-gatherer life was sharing. It was egalitarianism, and that existed for thousands and thousands of generations. I mean that's not that's not open to question. That wasn't invented by anarchists. You could, I've I've a lot of people have come to me after you know maybe I run into them later and they said I was suspicious of your take on how people live before civilization, and, but I'm taking this course. That's anthropology 101. Mm. Everything so look, you I'm said. Not, I'm, I'm not I'm not <laughs> I'm not disagreeing with you there. 
I, okay. I have read and I've heard people account that what it was like before agrarian civilization was just like anarchic hunter-gatherer tribes of 150 people or less, the Dunbar number of 150 people. Yeah. Um, part of the reason why civilization, like the agrarian civilization, took off was because they adopted different forms of social organization. Some of them r were based on religion, some of them were based on totalitarianism. What it allowed was for more people to operate in one tribe or one village or one city together, for good or bad, at, at least at first. If we were to look back in, at the beginning of the agrarian civilization and look at some of the codes that they live by, like the Code of Hammurabi, for instance, we'd say, well, that's morally repulsive. So well, you know, yeah. Of course, course, that's fully domestication civilization. That's nothing to do with uh, hunter-gatherer life. No, but no, yeah. no, no, no. The Hammurabi Code has been like a fully rejected in in many parts of the world, and today I think we have a lot, you know, some, something a lot better and more fair. Uh, I think Marxism uh, was really getting to the idea that history is fundamentally the growth of human productive power. And forms of society rise and fall according to their uh, ability to uh, enable growth. I don't know what that says about trying to guide civilization in, in an ethical direction, and I hope that it's possible for us to do that. I think it's definitely an experiment worth doing, and it seems as though there has been moral progress. What would you say about the moral progress of civilization? I mean, sure, there's lots of bad examples, but can't you see at least one good example of moral progress? Well, in, in within a certain context, we're we're struggling for that as well, you know, for sure. I mean, we're trying to live equitably and fairly and so forth. I mean, you, but that's that's accepting all these other givens that really drive the whole thing in a certain direction. Hmm. You know, I, I was thinking about this today. You probably not uh, care for this parallel, but it sort of struck me. You know, Marxism is at base. You know, it's it's the uh, it's the pursuit of the unfettered development of the means of production, right? It's that's the way Marx defined it his whole life. That's what progressive is: the progressive realization of technology. You know, in a general sense, that's what means of production means. I'm not I'm not sure about unfettered, but yeah. You know, well, every anything that stood in the way, he opposed it. Any war or whatever, he was on the side of stopping anything that impeded production and that's what transhumanism is in a way isn't it i mean you, that's uh, if yeah well, that's, that's, that's where we have to if, if we're looking at transhumanism as the the movement that it is you'd see that there's even amongst the founders of some of the ideologies within transhumanism there's massive amounts of people looking at trying to reduce risk with technology. And technology has been sort of called a double-edged sword by many futurists and many transhumanists. It's not just a catapult to success. It's not a springboard to utopia. It can go very badly. It's kind of like technology is an amplifier of our will in, in a sense. Well, I don't think that's quite correct because it seems as though if you look at the history of technology, it does have some form of quote-unquote teleology going on. It seems to be an optimizing power. We get to decide how it's optimizing things or what it's optimizing. I'm hoping that we can use technology to optimize uh, human flourishing and or, or person flourishing, and that would also include animals and uh, other okay. sense of life forms. But you know, that... that implies the the basic to me one of the most fundamental fallacies and that is technology is neutral it's all about how we use it what if that's false what if it what if it's the technology itself that really creates the conditions and the outcomes and it, it it's only secondarily a matter of how you use it well that, that's, that's what I was the way kind of so far about we've avoided the whole question by well. asserting that it's just it's just some discrete neutral thing. I, I fundamentally disagree. It's never been neutral. It's always from the very start. I mean, we were talking a minute ago about hunter gatherer. I think the real motive power at the most basic level was division of labor or specialization. Once you start getting that, and I think it was a very, very slow process, right? But you start having differentials of authority or power. You start having people that have 
some authority over others and it keeps going insofar as it keeps going and it has then you have classes of people that rule over others and so forth and then you have domestication i mean that's in other words that is not neutral that is that is a power uh thing and it's I, not I neutral. Guess we'd have to go back pretty far before de domestication took hold. I mean, it didn't just become an issue, it didn't just begin when agricultural civilizations booted up. No. There was some form of domestication in, in tribal gatherings. I mean, there, there were, in a sense, weddings. Uh, people used to like wear all sorts of wolf teeth and, and beads made out of bone, and they were buried in you know exotic ways, and there were obvious leaders the obvious people who are considered more important than others. Uh, this is going well, you know, that's, that's a question. If, the, if society practices domestication, you don't see much of that, or you see usually none of that, but you do as soon as domestication enters the picture. It's a watershed thing. It simply is. You, you don't have... I mean, we could talk about all these different things, ritual and so forth. When do they enter the picture? Yes, I think when. your references are quite recent, but they didn't exist. For example, there's no, there's no art past 30,000 years ago, and yet there were human species 2 million years ago, right? So, uh, you know... I thought it was a lot l earlier than that. The what was? Uh, the first art. Oh, I think the very, the very uh, latest ones in Europe are... France, right? 30, yeah, 30,000, 35,000 years ago. And, uh, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, we don't find... Uh, so, the, in other words, that's you're getting sort of close to the domestication uh, stage mm. for whatever reason. And, we, you know, we don't know everything about these things. I'm not trying to say I do or anybody does, but, but that's pretty recent. You're starting to see the breakdown of the egalitarian ethos. You're starting to see signs that people are slipping toward the domestication move. Mm. Okay, yes. So 40,000 years ago, the earliest rock art that has been dated back. Okay, so I thought it was a little bit earlier than that. The thing is, it's just that we found art 40,000 years ago. Um, I think there were various beads and such that may have been dated beyond that, but yes. That could uh, be. I mean, you can have, you can have symbolic artifacts, but you don't yet have symbolic culture. So, uh, you know, there we'll probably discover more things, you know, to push it back further. I, I wouldn't be too surprised. Right. Do you think this was a convergent phenomenon? Was this actually happening all around the world? Or was it just in one distinct location that people started putting handprints on walls and creating beads and, and using language and trading? Do you think this all came from one mistake in our history and then everything else sprouted from there? Well, yeah, it's kind of mysterious. You know, it, it is seems to be the case that in various parts of the world, at roughly the same time, it did start up. And, and you know, who knows if we'll ever figure that out as to why. But one aspect of that, by the way, it kind of makes the uh, climate theories unravel. And they have unraveled, I think, for that reason. In other words, Unless you had, you know, change an ice age and a change uh, owing to that everywhere on Earth, well, that's not the case. And yet, the domestication thing started on various continents at roughly the same time. So that I think that's sort of been abandoned as a as a reason. And you know, there's there's a lot that uh, is, is yeah, it's pretty much a mystery. But it's it hasn't worked out too well. <laughs> is our conclusion, you know. Yeah, I guess it depends on like uh, where we take technology in the next, uh, in this century or even earlier. I've just looked it up. It seems as though humans have been inhabiting caves and shelters for at least a hundred thousand years. Oh, way way earlier than that. Yeah. People were cooking with fire, according to some evidence, about two million years ago. Wow. The, the, there's some evidence from China of burned uh, uh, tubers. You know, uh, tough. Uh, Yep. Uh, root type things that they were softening up with fire apparently I mean that's that's way back there and yeah. yet they weren't uh, making art no. but you know but, that was, but, but would you consider the use of fire as a technology as a form of domestication no I, I don't think so I mean I think the I think a real uh, useful 
dividing line, if you will, and you know, all these things are a shorthand, you know, like you said about domestication, there are, it, it, there are probably gray areas, right, where is this exactly domestication, it shades into domestication, you know, in different places, it's not real black and white, I think, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know, it's, these things are, we, we are using a kind of abbreviated uh, terminology here, I, I grant you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well, you know, yeah. one thing, if I could bring this up, Adam, before it gets away, yeah. in, in passing, you said, uh, you know, the, the future of the technology, we, we will see what we're going to do with the technology, or, you know, words to that effect, I guess. But I think one thing that, one thing that we stress is there is no technology of the sort we're really talking about without the massive industrial base without the globalizing systematic destruction of the natural world, right? We tend to forget that because you and I are not likely to be in the mines or the factories, right? So we just look at this and, and we're using it at this moment. It's nice and clean and shiny and, uh, and we forget what the cost of it is, not and only to the earth, yeah. but, to, but right. to hundreds of millions of people. And, and okay. look at history too, yeah. I mean, it's not just today. History has right. been it, it, in, arguably a lot worse. I mean, like, we don't, well, we, don't, we, don't, we don't institute slavery around the globe as much as we used to, okay? Um, well, wiping out all these peoples all over the world, they, as soon as they're discovered, they're finished, you know, and uh, I don't know, that's... Uh, and, of course, the massive extinctions have, that are going on. Any, have you got any recent, like, examples of us wiping out people? What do you mean? I mean, what what survivors are there? I mean, they've... they've well, there's they're, Amazon survivors. They don't there's get new, to... New they new don't have a free choice. Their life world is destroyed. I mean, it's... There are... You know, I, I know native people here... In fact, I think it's important, by the way, the alliance between anarchists and native folks. But, and I'm not saying they're all gone, but you know these these uncontacted people, you know, you can count how fast they they're disappearing. They just they are not part of this world. They don't want to be part of this world. And as soon as they're found, you know, their days are numbered. Right? That's that's obvious. I mean, any natural you know National Geographic magazine every month tells you that. I mean. Let, let, so it's exactly I, I, a secret. I guess I have to disagree to a bit. I, I have, I've actually lived with Aboriginals in Australia um, when I was, I think, 17 or something. And I mean, yeah. although they hadn't been, as far as I know, they weren't brought up in a, like a tribal culture, like in the outback. But um, yeah, that, they had their views and, you know, that they had their like animosity towards civilization, but they didn't want to give up civilization either. Um, well, you, but it's not a choice. You, yeah. It's not a choice. You can't go back. You, you're not allowed. Why? And, and what's left of what's left of these different people? I'm, I'm, I'm no, I don't know that much about Aboriginal, but you know the tremendous alcoholism. Their their whole culture is shattered. And so then you say, well, they don't want to go back. Well, they're, I mean, what's left, right? It's it's not. You take away their whole traditional thing that's the way it goes around the world and then then what do they have left mm. nothing if you take away the culture in a sense that's what primitivism would do if the end point of primitivism is to get rid of all technology that would include all the cultural refinements that we've made over tens of thousands of years and that would include boomerangs that would include spears didgeridoos oh uh, no, no it, it wouldn't at all we know okay, that. Well, 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 okay, let let let's let's define what you mean by um, primitivism then, because I I thought that technologies like language would be sort of gotten rid of. Well, we could we could maybe might be helpful to hone in on what are tools and what are systems of technology, and then it becomes maybe a little clearer. You know, I was reading just recently about some hunting spears in that were found in what is now Germany, four hundred thousand years ago. These were big, long hunting spears, perfectly balanced and shaped. I mean, they weren't just sticks that somebody threw. They were, they were really finely crafted 400,000 years ago. I would say that's a tool. And I think the maybe one cardinal thing about it, or one way to look at it anyway, is can anyone make that tool 
roughly speaking? Can is do we have the autonomy to uh, to have what is needed to cope with life, to to survive and to flourish, as we did for so long? I mean, but and of course to turn it the other way, when you don't have that, uh, when you depend on others, I mean, you depend on experts. Uh, people who have power over you because you don't know how to do stuff. And right now, obviously, we're so de-skilled, it's pathetic. We don't have any autonomy. We're, we're just, we don't know how to do a damn thing, right? We're just completely, you know, we have our little specialization, but you used to be able to work on your car, for example, to use a crude example. I mean, I, I hope all the cars disappear, of course, but, you know, now you can't because there's 300 computer sensors in there. You can't begin to work on it. You need some expert to uh, to tell you what's going on with your car. I mean, you know, there's a million examples like that. And take to take it back to the Paleolithic, well, roughly speaking, anybody could uh, could do whatever to make a stone tool or either gender or you didn't need to call in, uh, you know, somebody who knew how to do what you don't know how to do. I mean, that's that's a crude way to put it. It's a generalization, but you can see what I'm saying. I can, but even back then, I'm not sure about 400,000 years ago, but um, there still seemed to have been trade. Hunter-gatherers living in the middle of like America, they would have trade systems going to hunter-gatherers living on the shore who would have access to different types of resources and different skill sets. And so the, right. They, right. they couldn't do everything. E each hunter-gatherer couldn't actually master all the arts. They still needed to, A, depend on other people in the tribe, and B, um, like a trade between tribes in order to get new and novel things like for their, for their tribe to sort of enjoy. Well, uh, yeah, no, I hear what you're saying, but, you know, one of the key mysteries still today among archaeologists is... For one million years, the design of uh, stone tools, the uh, Acheulean hand axe is a common uh, uh, exemplar of that, didn't change at all. One million years. And they were saying from the, they, they decided that they were roughly as intelligent as we are. In other words, they didn't want novelty. Hmm. So you might guess that it was working pretty well. But no, you're right. I mean, there was trade. Uh, some of that is fairly recent, but yeah, certainly there were. And yet, it didn't become private property until domestication. You you didn't have, you know, until people started working the land. You know, I did the work. I'm going to put up a fence. You know, stay away from my stuff. You know, the, then the Marxists missed this completely. That's the, the you know private property started there mm. that early. I mean, you know, that's yeah. kind of. It's, it can be argued that there were precursors to that definition of private property in the sense of tribal territory. Uh, yeah, there there yeah. were tribes that did were territorial, and then there were raiding parties that would go from one tribe into another and take their women, and that was quite reasonably common as far as I understand. I don't think there was absolutely no concept of ownership. It was just maybe not as refined as it is today, but there was yeah, certainly yeah. A, an intuitive some of these concept. things, Some of these things kind of bleed together, but, uh, you know, speaking of raiding parties, we don't, there's actually, uh, I don't think there's evidence for organized warfare until domestication, okay? What do you mean by organized? Because that's a... The, well, yeah, yeah. warfare... So a bit of spontaneous war. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, no. I mean, I don't think anyone could say there wasn't any violence, you know, personal violence. Who knows? There probably was. But uh, but yet they seem to work pretty hard at avoiding hierarchy and uh, letting some people become uh, the big man, you know, to be in charge. There were conscious strategies on that. Richard B. Lee is awfully good on that, that uh, they didn't, they, they were they were consciously trying to not let that happen, which really? is very interesting, I think. Yeah, especially, well, I'm thinking of uh, uh, in the Kalahari. He's, he's spent his whole career uh, uh, working on that. But anyway, yeah, it's the, again, it, these things do sort of bleed together. You know, maybe this is already domestication. You know, maybe yes, okay. Uh, but a lot of that is fairly recent. And then, it, then it's, of course, full-blown, uh, virulent domestication, right? And... And civilization starts right after that, right on the heels of that. It's like in a blink of an eye compared to the 
time frame of the whole thing, right? Hmm. Yeah, I, it does. <laughs> look, it, it seems like it's a blink of an eye, but it, I think it can be generalized to the idea that, okay, so we made some tools that made it easier to make the next level of tools. And so, like, the optimization process fed back into itself and enabled faster progress with each iteration. Well, no, that's, you know, again, that uh, the, the big puzzle for archaeologists, why didn't they change it in a million years? They oh, didn't, want, that was always the case. Like, they didn't yeah. want to move into, uh, and, into a, a different place, or they would have. I mean, right? I mean, they, that's why they are still scratching their heads. Why didn't they change it? They were just stuck. Well, or another way to look at it is why change it if it's working? You know, if it ain't if it ain't broke, why fix it? You know, kind of idea. Yeah, yeah. I was I was thinking about that before when you were talking about it. Like, uh, just just to clarify, I wasn't meaning that there was a law. It's only to create a technology, enough ones just around the corner to like make it better. I think it's human intentionality that's guiding so the initial technology is developed to improve the the lot of one's life in an agrarian civilization, right? But you know, mm -hmm. with side effects, <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so you were saying before that people consciously chose not to develop new technology past a stone axe and like some spears or whatever. I think that's contentious because there has been a number of people saying that it's not the case that people didn't want to. It's just that they weren't inclined to. It wasn't a conscious choice. Uh, and there may have been neurological differences or differences in how the, the architecture of the brain, which made it less likely at very early on that people would develop new technology. Um, it sure, could have been a, like a slight anatomical change, an evolution in one particular direction that um, allowed for humans to develop technology more easily. It's been said that the um, Homo sapiens were no more generally intelligent than Neanderthals, but they were better at language and, and better at using yeah, tools. Yeah. You know, but the Neanderthals were better at like uh, spotting animals in the distance and uh, were better at uh, hunting and survival without using tools. So there well, was, it seems though there was... It's always level. getting pushed back further, I think. Mm. But, uh, you know, it used to be thought that, well, people weren't bright enough to uh, change, to design other stuff. You know, they, they just weren't bright enough. Well, that's been discarded. That did really. Uh, that's been debunked pretty well. I'm, I think that's and that's why. That's why there's a central uh, uh, question for archaeology. Why didn't they change it? If, because, I mean, implicit in that is they could have changed it, but not. They couldn't. They were too dim to change it. Right. So yeah, otherwise, that, it's that, not. That otherwise, it's, it it's well. not a mystery. It's it's just how come it didn't change? You know. Yeah, and I'm, it's I'm, I'm it's another, saying... but it's it is contentious. It is speculative to say if they could have changed it and they didn't, isn't there some kind of consciousness there or not? I mean, you know, I, I'm yeah, inclined to think so, that there was. Look, if if it was a choice that everybody had back then, it wasn't some form of like an innate intelligence that that stopped them from creating tools. It could have either been a choice, or it could have been just a natural inclination. The many species that are very intelligent, but they're not inclined to develop technology in the way that we have, and it could have been the same. The the yeah, motivation, yeah, the motivational structure of the human brain might have changed causing like our motivation to be more inclined towards developing new and inventive ways of surviving in the environment, regardless of IQ levels. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's uh, although it wouldn't be such a mystery, once again, to archaeology, if it was just more like, uh, well, that's, that's the limitation of Homo erectus or whoever it was, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's maybe more than that, but maybe not. It, 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 is, it is speculative, and I don't know how yeah. we can really know for sure, okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if we did go back to primitivism, what would be the end point? How, how would we, where would we end up? What would it look like? And how would it look like over large amounts of time? Well, you know, we, this is all even more speculation, uh, certainly. I mean, uh, the way I look at it, I'm just telling you my personal uh, uh goal if you will is is toward a very radically decentralized world in which people can be accountable and take responsibility which is not possible very much in mass society 
where you have to resort to all kinds of experts for the simplest things and the and a bit of security uh, such as it is I mean that's I would think that that is a higher uh, that's a higher place if when people and you were talking about the the numbers you know it might be even less than 150 who knows or what or whatever it is but uh, you because if you think that it's it's a value to not be dominated and to have some control over your life and some connectedness with other people you can't you have to reject mass society you have to reject industrial technological modernity I, I can't really be fully on board with that I think that you know there, <laughs> there are things that that you can control and there's things you can't control in current society that are different from primitive society look I, I used to go to a like a sort of down-to-earth festival called confess in fact I still do occasionally in Australia I don't know if you've ever heard of it um, oh, no. yeah, 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 there is technology, of course, there's tents and torches and things like that, but the use of, like, uh, electricity is sort of frowned upon. You know, nobody oh. likes somebody who brings, a, like, a ghetto blaster to a campsite and turns it on. There's mm -hmm. a bunch of people sitting around playing guitars, flutes, and, and that sort of thing, and, you know, people going down to the river and bathing naked and things like that. So I have a, an affinity for nature. But I still, I, I still want the option. If somebody's like, you know, trying to like abuse my rights or or try and steal my stuff or or hurt somebody that I I know and love, then I, I want I want to be able to not just defend them using my bare hand. If there were an authority system there to help, I'd like to call on the cops when I need to, or get an ambulance to a hospital when I need to. Sure, sure. Oh yeah. We, we live in this world. I mean, maybe it's not the one we chose, but, you know, yeah, we, we try to uh, get by and, and do the best we can in this context. Yeah. Uh, there's another view in the sense that we've been sort of offloading our mental abilities onto the environment in a sense in the form of technology, not just mental but physical as well. And, of course, by doing so, we've freed up our mind to focus on things that we, quote-unquote, want to think more about. If we're constantly trying to get enough food to survive the next winter or, you know, make sure we get just enough kilojoules in order to survive the next week and then hope that we can get more kilojoules from some other resource, then we don't have the time to sit around and philosophize and think about these discussions that we're having right now. And so technology has enabled the sort of discussions that we're having right now. How would we be able to have this discussion in an environment where we didn't have the time, we didn't have recording of, of other people's thoughts, we didn't have science or historical accounts that are accurate. How would we be able to be having a discussion about anacro-primitivism and transhumanism and techno-progressivism and all that? Well, yeah, that's right. But uh, first of all, by the way, the, the number, the, the amount people worked is far more hours today than it was and this is a vast generalization but that's that's just an axiom of anthropology okay yeah, so it wasn't yeah, I like understand that yeah they were going to starve if they weren't uh, scrapping every minute to get by that's uh, you know that's not true well, generally it was speaking. true it was true in certain it, it, at certain times in the environment um, but it wasn't it wasn't true at all times and i think part of the reason why it wasn't true at some of the times because humans kept on moving into new fertile areas of the globe and and basically using the resources there to survive that would include like just hunting the easiest to to challenge like um, you know megafauna for instance oh yeah they were they were mobile they were they were movable they didn't uh they didn't have permanent uh, settlements yeah they that's right they they might have had two or three different camps during the year, and they would move. Uh, they would move among them, right? That's that's yeah. quite so. That that was part of the the general uh, deal. And, and but uh, we used to be you know pretty, now, how how much school. time do people have to think about anything now? The more civilization you have, the more work there is, as Marshall Solins pointed out. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't know why that is, but the more symbolic culture there is, the more work there is. Yeah. People are just on a fucking treadmill now. It's just well, I'm not so sure, but I mean, I think there is. Well, there are in America. I don't know about Australia, but if everybody here is working their ass off. Both cup, like the two uh, partners in a couple, they're both working now. That didn't used to be the case. 
and but and you know it depends on what we're thinking about too you know I'm, I'm kind of kidding here but i guess i've spent my life addressing the question of alienation and domination well i would be happy i think i'd be happy uh, to uh trade that away for a, for a disalienated world that isn't massively estranged and crazy yeah i wouldn't have to think about it mm. right i mean that's that's kind of uh you know by definition mm. but it's only you know we're trying to come up with these things because because things are so fucked up i mean you know that's <laughs> that isn't a plus that's just a that's just a burden that we have and we haven't done very well at figuring it out yeah uh, look there's no out about it we could have been we could have done better that's for sure but it, it seems to me as there's no guarantee uh, if, if we were re revert everybody back to a primitive society there's no guarantee that we wouldn't re-emerge as a technological society somewhere down the line um, I think that yeah. it, it's likely that we would um, this time there's not as much diversity in the environment there's not as many megafauna that are easy to hunt there's far too many people Oh, yeah. uh, and you know, like if if we were to go back to a primitive state, then we'd we'd have to, you know, we we wouldn't be able to be achieved if there were so many people in the world in the world, right? Right. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> it's it's more of a it's more of a direction. It's nobody is saying we could do that overnight. I mean, far from it. It's uh, it's it's that's why it's such a massive challenge. I mean, look how far we've gone and. Uh, and still people say, well, we've come this far, we can't go back now. That, it was in Brazil once, and somebody made this booklet, and that was on the cover. People climbing this, climbing this hill and then plunging over the cliff at the top. And the caption said, we've come this far, we can't go back now. I mean, there are all kinds of people that will tell you, oh, we've got to keep going. No matter how ruinous it is, no matter how many, you know, no matter how fast we're destroying the biosphere, and life in the most developed countries is becoming a nightmare. You probably read about all the shootings in the U.S., these, these sort of mystery, unexplained uh, bursts of homicidal stuff. And these, this yeah. is not even the usual craziness of gangs and so forth. It's just people just snap yeah. more and more, you know, kill, go to school and kill all the children or some shit. I mean, this, it's really gone bad. It's not just, well, we can tinker with the technology. I think the whole damn thing is sick, and it's leading us to the edge of, uh, I mean, to me, it can't get much worse. That it'll, be, it'll be obvious to people, this isn't living. This is anti-life. People are not happy. It's becoming pathological in society insofar as they are technological. The further we get on that path, the worse it is. Can I ask, you've probably... Um at least read about Steven Pinker's hypothesis that violence is in decline. Um, 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 and let, let, me, let me preface this by saying a lot of the reports we see over the news about like shootings and, and, and violence aren't emblematic of the, of the average violence in, in like the, the world, uh, even if we account for the third world as well as the first. Um, so yeah, like Stephen Pinker's hypothesis is there has been a decline in violence over over the the years, and now we're living in um, a time of least violence in recorded history. That's just history. crazy. You don't have to be. There's all kinds of people that have debunked the hell out of that. You don't have to be a primitivist. That's that's really rather insane. I guess the apologists for civilizations civilization now uh, come up with more and more crazy stuff. That's just he he's. Basically, he's leaving out entire realms of violence uh, by the way he's contriving it. And it, it just really, that's, that's just so, uh, look, we know that civilization is chronic war, chronic war from the very beginning and now just as much. And, it, you know, if, even if it were true that statistically, uh, given all the controls that people live under, yeah, maybe there is, maybe statistically, once you get to billions and billions of people, there, there aren't, there isn't a fantastic number of people being killed, but is that the best you can do for civilization? I mean, that's, and he does it in a, in a rather dishonest way. There's all kinds of people that have just shot holes in that from one 
way in another. I mean, it just really, it's it kind of preposterous, really. I, I just, you so know, you, that... You mentioned, like, that he's not really taking into account different forms of violence. What is he leaving out? What, what What's the best critique of his thesis that you've come across? Well, he's, he's leaving out every other species besides us, for starters. Uh, he's leaving out the fact that in the patriarchal world, which I think is another synonym for civilization, patriarchy, we're getting more, we're getting more misogyny, not less. We haven't, the, the Enlightenment said, you know, predicted all these things, you know, we, science and technology would fix everything, we wouldn't have superstitious, uh, we wouldn't have religious people killing each other. Well, none of that is even close to true. Yet he clings to the old claims that are just threadbare they're just wrong you know it just uh it's it's really and and you know if you read the if you read the reviews of the literature you can quickly see how how badly that book is fared right it's just really uh yeah everything is wonderful everybody's having a great life there isn't anxiety stress depression you know these these i mean you know come on that's, that's that isn't even funny. Well, I mean, I guess, you know, the, the people have different opinions about his work. Yeah, so, uh, look, I get that, like, you don't want to have society suddenly just instantaneously revert back to primitive society. But what would it look like over time? What would uh, going back to a primitivist society look like over time in this world? Practically, how do you see the roadmap of doing such? Well, I think for one thing, you don't pull down a system that you're utterly dependent on. So in other words, it it has to involve, on a real basic level, I think it has to involve moving from uh, de-skilling to re-skilling. You know, when, how, how do we move along that road so that we're capable of living outside of a domesticated, civilized world? I mean, that's, it's not going to happen unless unless we take up that practical challenge. I mean, that's, you can't just, you can't just put up a bunch of uh, ideological stuff and say, well, that's where we stand. You've got to, as you imply, I think, we, you've got to face up to, uh, well, how do you cope? I mean, what do you do? do you, if you want to be outside of it, then you better, you better know a few things, you know, like, and I'm sure from what you've said, I see that you are aware of this and, and, uh, going to the gathering that you referred to see the people trying to do that as, as people hear some numbers of people you know all the different things of what are the edible plants you know what are how do you how do you find out what the weather is, is going to be or you know any number of things that we we only get by turning on the computer or something you know we need to we need to be in touch with the earth literally not just figuratively or you know, quoting some nice poetic uh, statement by some indigenous person, but but really, and then that's that's got to be, you know, we can't jump over that step. And that's and I think the people that I've known that have skills like that, you know, sometimes they're called earth skills or whatever they're called, are much more able and willing. I mean, this is a generalization. I don't know how many people this would apply to. But they feel stronger about tackling what it is we're facing, you know, because they do have some ability to to be autonomous and to uh, be able to get by without all this artificial synthetic uh, mediation of, of of advanced technological society. It seems as though what you're saying in abstract is resiliency. How do we cope, right, over long periods yeah. of time, right? I agree. Yeah. I, like in 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 abstract, I do agree, and w I think it would be awesome if people would learn Earth skills, if civilization falls and we can learn to live off the Earth in a sustainable way, in a way that's perhaps even more wise and and uh, uh, sound than like mass hunting of animals and like for instance like herding them off the edge of a cliff only to eat a few would be awesome. One of the things I've been reading about recently is trying to determine which herbs in like a, a certain part of the world are going to or which plants are going to be good to eat like the inside of bark for instance just you can scrape the inside of bark off and you can sort of cook that and eat that um mm -hmm. you can there's, there's some roots which you can eat there's some insects which you can eat you know but not all of nature is edible and a lot of people don't know how to survive in nature now
all they would know is how oh that's a moving thing you know I, I think I can kill it and eat it um, <laughs> right so, yeah. so there's earth skills would you be in opposition to the idea of trying to refine technology so that wouldn't have as much of a, a footprint on the environment like more bright green technology and if you've heard of the expression or yeah. Ver Viridian Green, have you heard of that movement? I like, hadn't heard of that. Yeah, well, uh, so, so it's probably worth looking up. Um, and so the idea is to use technology, okay, to, to refine technology so it doesn't have a big impact on the environment. There's not a large footprint. I guess, in a sense, it comes from the idea that we're in a sort of adolescent phase with the high technology that is grown rapidly since the Industrial Revolution. We're still trying to get to grips with how we're using it or the, the impact that it's had on the environment. It's only relatively recently that we've seen the data come back and tell us that you know we're doing some damage to the environment and we may be moving into an Anthropocene stage yeah. in, in, in the, uh, I guess, yeah, you know, to refine solar power. Uh, the, through okay, the use of yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. But, you know what? We, again, what is conveniently forgotten almost always is what is the industrial base, the massive planet-killing industrial base required for this stuff. It isn't, and and solar. Let's think about solar. Hmm. Okay, these these panels burn out. They're very toxic. This stuff is really toxic. And if we're going to have if people project having enough energy and power from, say, solar, that's going to be another industrial uh, uh, dimension, right? It's, it's going to end, including how you move the energy around. You know, you can just look at the panel in the abstract. And, you know, I'm sure you know this as well as I do. People don't think about where it comes from. That's an extremely toxic process to produce. And once it burns out, an extremely toxic thing to deal with. Okay, that's that's industrial, like the rest of the industrial. In fact, people of many places in the US anyway, where the high tech industries are more toxic than the old steel plant uh, areas and so forth. So, you know, and look what's going on in China. I was just talking to somebody who's lived there for seven years. They have They have poisoned the air, soil and water and why? Because they need to catch up technologically. They need to have the whole infrastructure of technology. And but nobody wants to talk about industry. What is the what is the fatal cost, both to the planet and the people that have to do all the grunt work? You and I, like I said before, we're not going to go down the mines. We're not going to be on the assembly line or the warehouses. No, we're going to be having an abstract question about how do you use it. Well, I, I'm saying again, it doesn't exist without all of the awful bases for it. So the question of how you use it is very uh, minor, in my view. So I just want to make sure that I understand. I understand that there are some toxicities involved in any manufacturing process, well, most anyway, and maybe there is a, a large amount in trying to develop today's standards of solar panels, though that doesn't mean that there will always be the case. It could be that like, we can develop more biofriendly solar panels. In fact, I was speaking to someone, I interviewed him at CSIRO in Australia, who, who are developing printable solar material that's completely biodegradable. It's incredibly cheap. You also brought up the idea of where does this technology come from? If it's really cheap to produce and it's distributable, then at least it enables people to live outside of the main grid and use to, uh, like solar power, power things that they want to use in a village that's not connected to a massive mesh of power lines. It makes it easier to distribute these technologies to people in the outskirts of big cities. Okay, and, but isn't, isn't that a, an article of faith? It hasn't been so yet. Well, it the, has. These it's promises keep coming. They keep coming and they keep coming, and things are getting worse, worse, worse. Well, we're just, we're, I was we're just, acidifying I was the with. oceans. We're, you know, all of these dreadful things, the polarizes melting. I mean, the, you know, let's, come on. Hmm. Then we're supposed to believe, oh, more and more of this is going to be a good thing? I don't believe it. So more and more is probably not the way that I'd describe it. 
So my argument is refining some technologies that we already have. We don't need to have like more and more technologies appearing all around us. And it could be that technology gets okay more ubiquitous, but less easy to see, less invasive. Um, and but having a less impact in the environment. It's not more invasive. It's always more invasive. You know, smart. I was reading this morning about smart homes where people can't even figure, or cars that avoid collisions and, you know, they stop. I mean, what is that doing to the human as, a, as an agent, as, a, as an autonomous being? We're becoming more dependent, more inert, we're just going to sit there and and the the technology will do everything that's that's what's really coming down the line already we're just we're just it's so invasive and it's getting worse and worse it's not getting better we're not people are not becoming more robust or smarter or stronger or happier it's the opposite look what's happening with kids as say sherry turkle and others point out the attention span thing and i'm talking about america mostly here Attention span is disappearing, more illiteracy, people, you know, come on, people don't read books anymore. I mean, that's, that's because of the technology. It's not a good thing. It's making people stupid. There's, there's endless examples of that. People just become, uh, I, I mean, they're just, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Let's just say we, like society does um, progress slowly towards more of a primitive style society it's not going to happen overnight like if it were to happen let's say you know over a couple of hundred years at least how are we going to get there if we don't abandon the use of technology in how we're using it now we still need to refine technology to allow us to get to this primitive state i don't see it as just disregarding technology to get to a primitive state i think well of course of course that's exactly what it is well, you, you don't get away from technology by more technology, right? I mean, come on. I, but we may never get there. We may never get there. I'm not saying it's going to happen. You know, if people are going to, if, look, if people put up with this, if they're going to be just more and more uh, stupefied and dependent on, on the latest high tech thing to turn on their uh, thermostat or, or, what, or drive their car for them or whatever, and just rely on drug technology to avoid the the worst anxieties and depressions and everything like that. Well, then it won't change. We'll just become it'll just become more awful and ridiculous the way it's going with let's, more let's, technology. Let's just clarify. Okay, if you have two choices, one we have current technology for resource extraction and power extraction. Okay, so that's physical and electricity. Would you rather that we have more optimized processes doing that? with less impact on the environment or I don't current want, technology? I, I don't want any of that. Look, one way to put it is we need the power, we need the energy to do things that, have ne that should have never been done in the first place. They should have never been initiated in the first place. If you look at it that way, of course, you don't want, you, you're not trying to figure out how we get more power, how we more efficiently extract the last whatever it is, rare earths or gas or oil or whatever. You, you, you just don't. You don't want to do it. I mean, I'm, I'm not, but you don't, I'm sure you don't agree with me, Adam, but I'm yeah. just trying to clarify where I'm coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it seems as though in that case, it's very difficult then to gradually move from, you know, a technologically enabled society to a primitive society without actually using technology to do that. Um, well, yeah, like we're using it right now. I mean, I'm trying to get... Uh, I'm trying to contribute to the discussion, and uh, yeah, I've, I've got a weekly radio show. I mean, it's it's fully it's streaming, uh, you know, instantaneously around the world, and I'm glad it does. Hmm. But uh, yeah, but if you're talking about, but if you're trying to, you know, let's face it, try to persuade people that uh, we need to give up this this madness, then uh, because you know, like. Like I said in the Vice interview, I was talking about this radio guy here. He said, uh, well, if you, were, if you were consistent, you'd live in a cave. And I go, yeah, you're right. You're, if I was consistent, but then how could I contribute to the conversation if I'm sitting in a cave? So, you know, I didn't invent this world. I'm not happy with it, but here I am. Mm -hmm. 
and I and you, it's to me it's unserious to just say, well, I'm I'm not going to have any part of it. W again, what's the choice? I couldn't talk to you. And, I mean, it would take me a few years to get to Australia paddling a canoe. I guess there's, you know what I mean. I mean, you're right. I mean, we we wouldn't be having this conversation. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, like, it's technology is useful in some ways to propagate the ideas that like of primitivism if at each stage of development we recognize moral and political problems that are in the world does that oblige us to take these problems and try and solve them does that oblige us to try and change the world according to what we believe is the best way forward i think this is a process that humans go through over and over again it's part of the reason why we're here today we're, sure. we're always unsatisfied in a sense with our lot we want to improve our life. We want to change things that aren't right, that we believe are wrong. If you were in a hunter-gatherer tribe, and I was in a hunter-gatherer tribe, we could be debating about where, how much protection we put on our borders of our land, right? To make sure we don't have marauding tribes trying to take our, our fruit or steal our women. Uh, or, you know, try and like well, undermine our position. Yeah, I think, but again, you know, that's largely comes in with domestication. And if you... If you posit the erasure of domestication, then you're not fighting over land or, or objectifying women. They're, they're really, the, the literature uh, really uh, resists those cliches, frankly. But, yeah. uh, but, I, but I see your point. I see your point. And I'm, I'm all for more debate and argument, for sure. I mean, there, there's no way, for example, as an anarchist, I'm, I am opposed to imposing anything. But I want to try to contribute questions and objections to certain things, and so then we thrash it out. Mm. And it, it's not going to change unless more people are involved in this conversation, you know, to thrash it out, yeah, to yeah. decide. Mm. You know, it's not you and me deciding. It's, you know, people will decide either, either in absentia or, you know, passively, or they'll get involved and say, look, we need to make this a public issue and we need to have more conversation about what's really going on and why. You know, what are the roots of these of these problems? And, you know, all these different things. Yeah. And part of what makes these debates, thrashing them out, more useful to me is access to information. And we do have a lot of access to information. I can look something up that you say and just to see whether that's accurate or not. And you can do the mm -hmm. same to me in the middle of a conversation. That was never possible in the past, right? It was all right. based on cached ideas about what was right and wrong. And this access to information is incredibly useful to try and determine what the right thing to do is. So the more accurate view of the, the landscape of possibility that we have, the more data yeah. we have to like help refine what we need to do, right? Well, exactly. For example, sitting here in Oregon, in the northwest part of, of the U.S., uh, I definitely rely on information on what's going on to the planet in terms of severe weather or, you know, all these different things that seem to be going south. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't know all that uh, if I wasn't in, you know, as you say, you, we, we, uh, that in fact, largely that's my weekly radio show is bringing in uh, different things, news of different things during the week that maybe uh, not everybody's heard about, you know, so to, to base the conversation on, as you put it, I think. Mm. And it's, so, I, I don't know if it would be possible to maintain a sufficient level of wisdom or knowledge, access to information in a primitive society. Yeah, I, I just well, don't but, know how this... this, this you wouldn't, but, uh, but you wouldn't need it, because you don't have a globalizing, totalizing machine that operates as a world system, mm. right? It's broken down. Your responsibility is the 80 people you live with. That's how you're accountable. Mm. That's what you're responsible for and not running the world. Yeah, yeah. We're I not guess the anarchists who have a plan to run the world. We're, we're, how do we get to the place where we don't need to run the world? That's, that's kind of the bottom line idea, I think, in part. Yeah, I guess so, this comes back to what you know, I pointed out before, is that without a certain threshold of knowledge and language to be able to embed these ideas in, there's no guaranteeing that that would stop a civilization from arising or developing technologies to better their lot. I think that's natural to the human condition. I think that's maybe a contention that we'd have. I, I, I do think it's natural for humans to want to better their lot, to progress 
in a way. And that may, in primitive societies, mean developing better weapons to counter somebody else's weapons or developing more well, better political strategies to be able to It didn't to change much for two, two million years, though. So if human yeah, nature yeah, with the hand neck, that, means but, changing things all the time, that's, that's really not the record. Uh, okay. We've got... You know, we've got, what, 10,000 years versus 2 million years? That's, uh, I think the human nature argument is probably more aptly based on uh, the the long no change kind of a thing, basically, right? Wouldn't you say? I mean, why? Well, why... I, okay, I don't agree right now, but I think the idea is everybody really should do the research. I don't think they were Homo sapiens, but they were like a part of the Homo erectus family that did develop um, hand axes. There were some... Uh, slight but significant changes in the architecture of the brain since then and and I, I think a lot of anthropologists do argue that the reason for the change in how we operated towards a more optimizing form of like society was partly because of that change a selection presser to there, there was selection presser to uh -huh. select four strains of humans that yeah, had yeah. the ability it, to sure. optimize yeah. their environment there, there were some changes. Yeah, there definitely were, and and you may be familiar with this one, uh, one thing that's really current now from the the work of this guy Rangham. He postulates that about a, a 1.5 million years ago, that's when people really started eating meat, and it grew the brain quite significantly, fairly quickly, mm -hmm. and you know, so yeah, there were changes. I mean, there were, and people. Uh, yeah, the people, there were other tools added to the toolkit, you know, at different at different times. I'm, I wasn't saying there was no changes, but they didn't move to domestication for quite a long time. I think that's, you know, if that's the watershed, then... Uh, yeah, but that watershed know, is, is quite a long one, and it's a little bit ambiguous what domestication means. If we take domestication to mean any form of, like, the institution of technology to enable survival or to increase the odds of survival, that would include, like, our training dogs. That would include, well, like, you I, know, I, I'm strategy. Just, I'm and, just using the standard definition, the standard, uh, you know, textbook uh, dictionary definition. That's all. I'm not, yeah. I'm not uh, going, I'm not going past that. I mean, it, the standard one is, you know, domesticating uh, animals and plants taking over engineering them for your own purposes that's that's precisely what i mean i'm not i don't have any esoteric definition of it it you could make it more general but then you know according to the common usage that wouldn't be domestication because you're not changing the nature of animals or plants you 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 know you're still in the stage where you take what nature gives rather than uh you know colonizing uh first uh first uh, plants and then animals, you know, as it, as it usually happens. Yeah, I just looked up the domestication of dogs and I did find that it seems as though they've been going, that's been going on for quite some time, um, you know, like tens yeah. of thousands of years ago. That's, but, um, that's the one exception, okay? In the literature, it's understood that dogs, there was a mutual, a kind of co-domestication, but only symbiotic. dogs. Yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the one exception. Uh, dogs came to humans as much as humans came to dogs, but there is evidently there's no other species that it happened with. And some people have used the dog thing to argue for domestication and the, <laughs> forgetting that that's the only. Uh, I mean, there's always some contrary example, I guess, and dogs are the contrary example. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no clear-cut definition of when domestication really began and when it didn't. I think it, it's a little bit ambiguous, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, and different, right, right. You, you, it, when you get into horticulture, there are, as you may know, there are uh, kinds of horticulture where you know, I've seen these pictures of forest uh, gardens where you couldn't spot the garden. Mm. You could examine these different pictures and you wouldn't know where the heck the garden is because there's no fences. Mm. And it's just growing. And yet, supposedly, that horticulture was, it, it, you know, in some ways uh, already domestication. So what you're saying is right. Sometimes there's, it's a very difficult way to draw the line. Mm. So... Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, do, do you want to, uh, we could email and, and try to set something up. I could, 
when Alice is feeling better, I could maybe I could figure this out better with her help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that that's fine. But one of the things I would like to discuss next time is the idea that I think both transhumanists and many others are really worried about, and that is the idea that we may be optimizing ourselves out of the picture in a sense. Yeah, we, we're developing computational models, artificial intelligence, robotics. So unlike the industrial revolution where a lot of the physical labor was replaced by machines, now a lot of the mental labor is replaced, knowledge work and everything is replaced by algorithms. And mm. it may be that we're moving into a stage where our services are no longer required. And well, I might be arguing for your point here, but this is something <laughs> that we both need to really consider, okay? Oh, well, yeah, that's now, fascinating. I'm, I'm sure you... Uh know more about it than me, but yeah, let's take that up. I, I would be fascinating well, to me to talk you, about it. Definitely, I can send you some links and all that. So, um, uh -huh. yeah, uh, look, look, the, the idea is that like, um, if we do move into that stage of existence and we could end up having all the time that we want in the world without working, but the other side of the thing is if we're no longer needed, then why would whoever has the levers of control keep us around? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, once again, I know I'm harping on this one point, but where does the industrial basis for it come from? Mm -hmm. Even if you have robotics. But anyway, let's, let's, uh, we could save that and explore that. Uh, right. So let's, let's uh, be in touch real soon. And I think maybe I, I can uh, get some help at this end. Mm -hmm. Excellent. No worries. All right. All Thank right, you. Talk to me, man. Yeah, yeah, great. Cool. Speak soon. Okay, man. Take care. Yeah, take care.